On a Monday night in the middle of summer, hundreds of thousands of people watched a virtual event where a historian spoke about a 900-page Republican playbook. It sounds like some D.C.-based strategist's dream, but it was just another day at Red Wine and Blue. This past Monday, July 15th, Heather Cox Richardson joined us to talk about Project 2025, and we wanted to share the audio of that conversation with you. Whether you missed the event or just wanted to listen to Heather again, please enjoy this conversation about Project 2025. We got to address the suburban women problem because it's real. What do an economist, a microbiologist and state representative, and a fierce advocate for democracy have in common? We're We're all suburban suburban moms. moms. The far right is trying to win over suburban women by pretending they're reasonable, even relatable. But we're smarter than that. Join us for a political journey through the eyes of suburban women, one conversation at a time. Welcome to The Suburban Women Problem, a podcast from Red, Wine, and Blue. Welcome to you all, whether it's your first time or your hundredth time joining Red, Wine, and Blue tonight. Seeing all your names and where you're from is my very favorite part, but tonight it's just going to get even better. For those of you who are new to Red, Wine, and Blue, maybe this is your very first time with us tonight. This is our seventh event with Heather Cox Richardson, and we're so glad that you're with us tonight for an event that so fully represents who we are. My name is Katie Paris, and I'm the founder of Red Wine and Blue, and who we are is a community of over half a million women who are working together day in, day out in our communities and throughout this country to defeat extremism. So, This is what we know. We know that we need community right now more than ever. And being here together tonight is a defiant act of community. The Trump rally violence was so horrifying, but I really want to be clear. This is not the moment to be silent. Democracy requires us to stand up and speak truth. So here's the deal too, 70% of voters today don't know about Project 2025, don't know what it is, don't know what it does. That changes tonight. No one is coming to save us. We have got to do this ourselves. We need to be the trusted messengers. So we've got to remain focused. And the fact that you're here tonight shows that you are. Tonight, we're going to give you the tools to make sure that you are able to share what you learned tonight with your friends and family and in your communities with everyone you know in the most effective way possible. Because we can't just we can't just listen, though listening is so important. But Heather is going to tell us that action is so important too. So speaking of, the woman who truly needs no introduction because she shows up in our inboxes every day to keep us calm, to keep us sane amidst the chaos and the storm. Heather Cox Richardson, are you with us tonight? I am. And I just have to say, I am grinning here because people write to me all the time and they tell me they're frightened and they can't, they feel alone and they don't know what we can possibly do to take back democracy. And on my Zoom, there are 30,000 people here already. And, you know, this is, and what I always say is, would you have turned out like this 10 years ago for democracy? And the answer is like, I I didn't even think I would have turned out 10 years ago for democracy because I kind of thought somebody else was taking care of it, but they weren't. And now it's our turn. And so welcome everybody. I'm so thrilled you're here, but, but I'm really glad I'm here because this is a movement and it's really cool to be part of it. Oh, I'm so glad to be a part of this community and part of this movement with you, Heather. So I want to dive right into what is going on in the world, as you always do. In today's newsletter, you quoted Edward Luce of the Financial Times, who noted, almost any criticism of Trump is already being spun by MAGA as an incitement to assassinate him. This is an Orwellian attempt to silence what remains of the effort to stop him from regaining power. What do you say to those who claim that discussion of Project 2025, Trump's extremist plans, or even just his own violent rhetoric is somehow polarizing or even causes violence. Well, you know, that really flips the script because what they are really saying is it's not what I did, 
it's your reaction to it. And that's something you simply cannot allow to stand in any kind of a relationship, but certainly politically. This is not, it's not extremism to call out extremism. It's the other way around. And the thing that's so interesting about this moment is that the vast majority of Americans, whether there's an, a D by their name or an I or a G or an R, don't want the extremism that is currently represented by Trump and the MAGA Republicans. And this is the moment when we figure out how to work together and say, you know, listen, I might disagree with you about immigration. I might disagree with you about debt. I might disagree with you about different kinds of education. But I can agree that the guardrails of our democracy need to stay in place so we can have these discussions. And I don't want to have a dictator. And that's, I think, what we're, I think at this point, what are we up to? I think that's at least what 32,000 people in America are thinking right now at this very moment. And imagine all these 32,000 people talking to other people in America later tonight and tomorrow and every day for the next four months. We can do this and we're going to keep talking so everyone feels really confident in doing that. Okay, so we have to call out extremism. We have to speak up. So let's start with the basics. People came here tonight, Heather, because they want to hear Heather Cox Richardson talk Project 2025. Where does it come from? What is it? Who is behind it? Okay, so I may sound a little nerdy on this, but you remember, I really care about ideas and how we talk about ideas. And Project 2025 is about 930 pages of ideas about the next uh, administration of Trump or a Trump-like figure. You know, it's important to remember that they're not just focused on Trump, and that actually has something to do with putting J.D. Vance on the vice presidential ticket today. But what it does is it sets out a vision for that kind of a leader. And it's important to remember that it's really pushed by the Heritage Foundation. And Heritage Foundation, you may remember, used to be kind of a normal right-wing think tank. But Heritage got a new president about three years ago, two years ago, somewhere in there, who developed a, a partnership with the Danube Institute in Hungary, which is a, an arm of Viktor Orban, who is the Hungarian leader who took over a democracy and has turned it into a dictatorship. And the the pattern that Orban has put in place in Hungary is one that the Heritage Foundation wants to import into the United States. And what's really important to remember about this larger picture is that they are deliberately turning against democracy. They say they are turning against democracy. They do not believe in democracy for the reason that they believe that treating everybody equal before the law, which is the, the hallmark of a democracy, weakens a nation by requiring women to be treated equally, uh, LGBTQ plus people being treated equally and minorities being treated equally. And they believe that those things weaken a nation. So their idea is to get rid of democracy, get rid of the legal system that makes everybody treated equally, and instead create a very strong central figure who will impose the kind of Christianity on the country that they would like to see. So that's sort of the big picture of what's at stake in Project 2025. I want to play a clip of the guy you just mentioned, Heritage Foundation President Kevin Roberts. And let's keep in mind, it's not just the Heritage Foundation. I understand it's 110 conservative organizations, this foundation to even like Moms for Liberty, right? And everyone in between who have signed on to this being the agenda of Trump's second term and filled with his allies, of course. I want to play a clip of the, from the president of the Heritage Foundation, Kevin Roberts. Let's play it. We are in the process of the second American revolution, which will remain bloodless if the left allows it to be. Only six seconds that clip was, um, but but very chilling. I think just especially in light of events of the, the last few days. Heather, what's going on here? Well, so it's a chilling clip. It's a really interesting clip because again, it reverses what's really going on here. One of the things that jumps out about that clip is that he he is making that statement because they are such a small minority. You know, this is an attempt to say we're advancing this new version of American society and it's an American revolution, but it's in fact something that we have never seen before. So the, the Project 2025 wants to create a very strong dictator in the country. It wants to get rid of the, the, the civil servants who have run our administrative state really for, for centuries now and who sort of provide a ballast in the country because they don't care who's president, they just are trying to get their job done. So it's going to get rid of civil servants it's going to take that very strong president 
and make both the Justice Department and the military answer only to that person. And then once they have done that, they want to put in place a series of legislation, a series of laws that will make uh, women, for example, people of color, um, LGBTQ plus people, subservient to a few white leaders. So what they're trying to do is to bring back their version of an ancient Christian vision, which was never real in America. So he's almost kind of reversed things there. I actually do believe we're in the middle of an American revolution, but it's not his. It's ours. It's like that original American revolution where people said, hey, we don't think we should have kings. We think the people should be treated equally before the law, even though at the time they only meant white men. That idea that we should all be treated equally before the law and have a right to a say in, their, in, in our government, that's revolutionary. And then we had a second American revolution during the American Civil War where people said, you know what? This maybe shouldn't apply only to men. It should also apply or only to white men. It should also apply to black men. And by the way, women who start to talk about having voting rights during the Civil War. Now, they're not going to get it for a while. But I think what we're seeing nowadays is the opposite of what he says. And that's the majority of us. And remember that more than 80 percent of America want things like common sense, gun safety legislation, reproductive rights, all the things that we hold so dear, where we are stepping up to the plate and saying, no, a few people have tried to take over the the levers of power in our democracy, and they're trying to impose minority rule on the rest of us, and we're not going to put up with it. We're going to push back and restore American democracy. So in a way, it's an American revolution, but it is one that reasserts our original principles. And by the way, once again, although that radical extremist group on the right wants to say that it is, in their minds, the left, that is violent. In fact, it's the opposite. It's the right-wing extremists, the neo-Nazis, the KKK, the, the militias that are the ones creating violence in our streets. So those of us who would like, you know, to have a, a, a community where we can, uh, can interact with our neighbors and we can have jobs that pay living wages and that we can have decent educations for our kids and all those sort of things that we want we're actually the ones who were holding steady. We're the ones holding the middle. We're the ones who were moving into the future, but also in a really cool way, reaching back to our past to say, yeah, we're going to stand with Abraham Lincoln and we're going to stand with Fannie Lou Hamer and we're going to stand with Robert, uh, Robert Kennedy, the original one. And we're going to stand with the people who were trying to create a nation in which we would all be treated equally before the law. So we are those people who are the great center of America who has saved it in the past and we're, we'll save it again. Such an important reminder about us, us being the majority, represented right now by almost 35,000 people watching this call right now, refusing to be divided and instead saying yes to community and being here together tonight. That gives me hope. And it, 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 it's a reminder that, that clips like that are meant to chill us, to make us feel afraid, to make us be silent. And you are, in fact, pointing to the very inspiring actual revolution that we all are a part of here tonight. Um, that, that's a really good point. He is doing that because he is not in power. This is a small yeah. group. But if they scream loud enough, the rest of us will get nervous and think that we can't push back. All right, Heather, speaking of the pushback that we often get online, we're hearing this constantly, that people are sharing, you know, spreading the word about Project 2025, and they get this pushback of, oh, now come on, that's hyperbole, that's fear-mongering. But we're already seeing a lot of this implemented, aren't we, at both the state and the federal level, the judiciary? What have you seen so far that convinces you, and thus, you know, what we can be talking about as well, that convinces you that this is real, this is a real threat? All right. So just just so you know, I think this is a real problem. I have a hard time writing the letters at night because the stuff that's happening is so extreme. You kind of feel like you're you're you've got a tinfoil hat on. You're like, really, this can't be this bad. But it is. And let me start with the way we know that is that extraordinary decision by the Supreme Court in Trump versus the United States that said that a president who commits crimes in the process of his his official duties cannot be prosecuted for those crimes. 
that's actually more power than George III had in 1776. That is that is unbelievable. And there's been so much happening that people haven't really paid as much attention to that as they need to, because that undermines the entire premise of our American government. But in terms of Project 2025, indeed, we can see aspects of that implemented in states that, have, that are Republican-dominated. Now, people say Republican states, but they're not. They're states that are dominated by Republicans, often by voter support oppression or by gerrymandering. So, for example, the idea of um, uh, extreme abortion bans that don't allow any exceptions for rape or incest, we already have those in the state level. Or places where we've lost uh, great grounds in the public schools to vou the voucher system, which essentially takes taxpayer money and gives it to people who were already, whose children were already in uh, private schools, especially religious schools, takes that tax money out of the public schools and gives it to those, those private schools. Um, that's already been implemented in a number of states. And we know that in addition to any of the morals that you might not like in those private schools, it also means that the ability of children to, to to actually learn things plummets. I mean, it's, it, those are those are almost never the, the kind of extraordinary private schools one likes to imagine. It's just a way really to take tax dollars and put them into private schools that are not accredited necessarily and that are um, that are for profit schools. So we're seeing uh, in LGBTQ plus laws, you're seeing those uh, anti trans laws, you're seeing those. So we have that. I guess one of the ways to think about it is that Everybody says that authoritarianism couldn't come to America, but you know, we really sort of had it in the United States between about 1874 and about 1965, when in the American South, there was a one party system in which uh, black and brown Americans did not have rights. And while some white people seem to think that they did, if you remember, and if you remember your literature from that period, you know that it really, the rights that people had in the South really were quite dependent on how they were related to the people in power. And it was, it was, you know, it was really the kind of authoritarianism and the kind of economic backwardness that you see in places nowadays like Hungary. And so, you know, we've done it before, but I get that. I get that it's hard for people to understand that it's really real. So many people in the chat were reflecting in their own states how they're seeing so many of these laws. And I think that that's important when we hear that pushback of, come on, this isn't real, localizing it to what you know and you're seeing with your own eyes and sharing that. And I think that can help people connect as well. We're going to talk more about how we talk about this um, later in the hour. Right now, Heather, you have impacted the lives of so many people, you know, giving us hope, keeping us informed day to day. And some people have then come to Red Wine and Blue to really put that into action with other local women in their community. I thought it would be really cool to hear from some of these women because I think it reflects the experience of so many of these 35,000 people who are watching right now that you have impacted. So I want to invite a few of our local grassroots leaders. These are Trouble Nation leaders. Trouble Nation is our national organizing program that helps grassroots groups locally get started and helps those that already exist grow and strengthen by connecting them with others in their area in our network. So I am so thrilled to have with us Susan Nielsen, Ari Goodman, and Sharon White. Um, welcome, y'all. Coming in hot up with, with Heather Cox Richardson. How, how cool is that? I wanted to start with you, Susan. Can you tell us why you started your Trouble Nation group and what's the reaction been like since first sharing about Project 2025? Because you're ahead of us out there getting the word out in your community. I'm in California and most people think California is a democratic state and we don't have any you know, extremists or anything like that. That is not true. Um, the first thing started with um, our recall of our uh, extremist school board member um, who spent over a million dollars on lawsuits, anti-LGBTQ um, outing policy? They were they're trying to gut the Department of Education, and financially they're doing it. Um, so we did with a grassroots effort, along with a PAC, a Temecula PAC, and the teachers union. We um, did recall. We voted in June, and we recalled the um, school board president. I was not political until all this happened. And then I just really got motivated. And we started the Temecula Valley Resistors in March of 2023. And we meet, We've, we have 64 people now. We started with two and we've had three meetings so far. And in the second meeting, uh, that was in May. And when we were supposed to talk about Project 2025, not all members had heard of that at that time. 
<laughs> but now they are spreading the word. Ari, I heard actually, Ari, you had an event scheduled for tonight to talk about Project 2025, where you are. Uh, okay. What happened? Uh, that we had Heather Cox Richardson coming and we pushed our meeting to next week. But um, we're really excited because we're a new group. Um, we meet virtually and we only had five members when we started, but when we listed our Project 2025 uh, series, we're now up to 40 members. And that's just because people are wanting to learn more about Project 2025. Amazing, Ari. It really, people are, I mean, look at the reaction we had to this event. It's the same thing happening right. locally. And I hope other people hear that and say, okay, if I put out the word, I'm going to get the deluge. People are going to come. They want to have this conversation. Sharon, has it been hard though to have these conversations? How have you been able to make it digestible for everyone? Um, we 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 had one event in May, um, but since then we've been I've been doing little newsletters, and my credit to Heather for writing because like writing one newsletter that's like every two weeks. I don't know how you do every day, so hats off to you. <laughs> um, but in our little newsletter, we are featuring you know an aspect of Project Twenty Twenty Five. Um, and um, the latest brain wave is to try and connect it to like, you know, every month is a theme. So July is Disability Pride Month. So uh, we're probably going to talk, I've, I'm thinking we'll talk, probably talk about education because I'm a parent of a child who had learning, who has learning disabilities. Um, so I'm, and that's how I'm trying to think to marry it, to try and build that connection between what we do, you know, the month and then Project 2025 and how it impact a population. So. Um, and, and the feedback I'm getting is that, you know, people don't know about Project 2025. I mean, I volunteered uh, for the Arlington Dems during the primary. And um, but I think of the 12 people I spoke to outside in the hour, only two had heard of Project 2025. And I'm, I'm in Northern Virginia, so I was shocked that it was that low. That's exactly why what you all are doing is so important. So, Heather, I want to ask you, what it, how important is it? for these women, what they're doing locally to take this kind of action? Historically, what difference has women acting at the local level made? It's everything. I mean, it's everything. And and that, so, so I could give you all sorts of um, moments in which women's organizing has changed American society. I mean, the obvious one is the Alliance Movement of the 1890s that becomes the populist movement that gets picked up by the Democrats and completely changes American society. But I would like to suggest tonight that there's something else going on and that's in our era and is that we are the first generation of women and men but who have a, a serious period of time after our children have left the home or our careers have gotten to a point that we're happy with them and want to do something else in which we have a period of you know 20 to 30 years in which we have skills and connections sometimes money understanding of the world and the ability to ex to to execute plans to change it. And I actually think that's brand new because of, of our the fact we've been able to get educations and been able to have money in our own names and have longer lifespans. And so we're in this moment that it certainly feels like uh, we are doing something entirely new. And I don't think it's an accident that in this moment in which that's the case, there is something like Project 2025 that is trying to destroy those rights for women, that is trying to make sure women don't get those rights and puts them back into a situation where they don't have control over their reproductive health, which is the first thing that women need to be able to take those larger roles in society. So where we've always been important, but this feels like a game changer, both historically and in this particular moment. It's so empowering to hear that. I want to thank the women who came on and shared what they're doing. Hopefully it inspires so many other people who are watching the call tonight. Let's keep going. As um, Project 2025 has started to get a little bit more attention, Heather, Trump and Republicans are trying to downplay it, distance themselves from it. I believe Trump said recently they've never even heard of it. What's going on here? What part of the playbook are we are we looking at? Yeah, that's actually that, again, that's really interesting because that's ridiculous. I mean, it is literally the same people. The people who wrote Project 2025 were in Trump's first administration. They are in line for other positions if there is a second administration. He introduced the project. Um, you know, they his own PAC advertised it as the Trump tw Project 2025 plan. I mean, it's that's that's ridiculous. But what is much what is what is important here is that what they have figured out is how 
how much Americans don't like Project 2025. So what they're trying to do is split the baby and say to their extremist supporters, especially the even white evangelical extremist supporters, here, we'll quietly tell you this is there. But for the more moderate voters who, you know, are probably not paying close attention, we can say, oh, we're really not at that extreme. But let me tell you, the fact that J.D. Vance is the person that President Trump has tapped to be his vice presidential candidate, J.D. Vance doesn't really bring anything that a normal uh vice presidential candidate would bring to a ticket. You know, he he doesn't necessarily bring a state. Um, uh, Trump is, is, you know, fairly strong in Ohio anyway. He doesn't bring in a new constituency. He doesn't bring in anything except his support for everything Trump and for Project 2025, which he has praised. He has also praised Viktor Orban. And J.D. Vance has the skills to put it in place when Trump can't focus on anything. He's the one who will be able to do that. So um, that that Project 2025 is central to, um, to the Trump presidency in the past, but also going into the future. And I assume we're going to do a little bit on detail on that, right? Yeah. Okay. So there is some politics going on here of trying to sort of whisper to the more extreme elements of the party while sort of downplaying to those who represent more of the majority. I think that a lot of people in our community have been sharing, actually, that as they have shared information on Facebook, Meta, the Facebook parent company, has been flagging some of this information shared about Project 2025 as false, partially false, saying that fact checkers have looked at that. That's false. Why is this happening and what is the impact? Because it certainly feels like a broader effort to kind of play this down. Yes, there is, as I say, this broader effort to play this down. And there's two reasons that that fact checking is happening. One is that there's a lot in Project 2025, some of which is self-contradictory because it's written by a number of people. So you can say, well, that's not what we said. Look over here. We said something different. But that doesn't mean that the the original piece is not the one that will will be the one that will be put in place if, if there is a second Trump administration. But more than that, a lot of political platforms have kind of coded language. You have to look and understand what you're seeing. And the one that always jumps out to me, somebody wrote to me and said exactly that, that they had had read an article, I believe it was in the dispatch that said, oh, it's not true that in fact, Republicans have called for um, for a national abortion ban. And I was, and I, you know, I, I use this word sometimes, I was gobsmacked because you have to understand what the words meant. In Project 2025, it says that, that life will be uh, protected from the beginning. What they're referring to is something called a fetal personhood bill. And what that means is that the second a sperm meets an egg, that fertilized egg, before implantation, by the way, has all the rights of a full-grown human being, which means that anything that happens to that fertilized egg is as if you were doing it to a fully-fledged human being. So, for example, that rules out um, any kind of abortion, of course. It rules out, because that would be murder, it rules out IVF, it rules out a lot of different kinds of contraception. And it also raises questions, as people have actually put in place already in some states, what happens if somebody miscarries? Whose fault is that? Can somebody get into trouble for maybe ingesting something and then having a miscarriage? I mean, the 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 what fetal pe- personhood does is really, really scary. And you sit there and say, oh, that couldn't possibly happen because that's just so fringe. And indeed, it was fringe when people first started begin talk, begin beginning to talk about something like that in the 1960s. It was considered way out there and totally fringe. But by now, by about uh, 20, uh, 2008, it began to be sort of talked about and accepted among certain white evangelical circles. And now there have literally been bills introduced in the Congress of the United States of America to, in fact, impose fetal personhood on the country. Now, but here's the kicker to that. The argument behind fetal per... I'm such a nerd. I'm sorry, but I love it. I love it. We love it. That's why we're here. The, The kicker to this is that If their argument is that from the minute that sperm meets the egg, it is protected by the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, which says that there's nothing you can do um, by in a state in a state or in state laws that will impact the rights of that that fertilized egg. But here's the kicker to that. 
The 14th Amendment is the second amendment in our Constitution that gives power to the federal government rather than takes it away. So the final article of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution says Congress shall have the power to enforce this amendment by appropriate legislation, which means that the National Congress, the U.S. Congress, according to this theory, has the power to say to the entire country, the minute a, sp a sperm meets an egg, it has all the rights of a human being, and then there goes abortion at a national level, IVF, certain kinds of contraception, and a, and a legal code for what happens when somebody loses a pregnancy. And that is absolutely in Project 2025. So somebody who says, well, they're not saying we want a national abortion ban is somebody who does not understand the legal and the historic angle of the idea behind a fetal personhood bill. I mean, it reminds me there's some parallel, of course, of many Republican politicians saying, of course, I support IVF. Of course, I support birth control. But then voting against it, supporting this agenda that does, in fact, have policies which would have those results. So that's why it's so important to like know this, understand it and to hear from you so we can, that we can be confident because that's the whole point. They come after us. And the point is to silence us, to make us cower, you know, instead of to stand up and speak truth. So, so clarifying. Well, so here's another one. When they keep saying um, they're not coming for Social Security insurance, you know, for Social Security, and they always say, oh, that's never going to happen. That's not what we mean. And they've gone forward and said, we're going to protect Social Security. Real doublespeak, because their version of protecting Social Security means that they're going to protect the fund behind Social Security without adding to it. So the Democrats under Joe Biden have and Kamala Harris have called for higher taxes on people whose income, not wealth, but income is more than $400,000 a year. That's a lot of money. That's their yearly income is more than $400,000 a year. And to take that money and put it into things like Social Security. Similarly, they want to get, get the, the very wealthy tax evaders to have to pay up the taxes that they owe to the U.S. government. They've already recovered more than a billion dollars doing that in the last year. They plan to save Social Security by beefing up the money in it. The, Dem the Republicans want say they will save Social Security by protecting that pot of money and making sure people take less out of it. So what they mean by that is they're going to save Social Security by raising the, the age at which people can claim it and by reducing the benefits. Now, if that isn't a cut to Social Security without saying it's a cut to Social Security, I don't know what is. But when you hear, no, no, we're going to save Social Security and we're the ones who are going to save it, when they, they say that to Democrats, what they're saying is they're going to save it by cutting crucial pieces of it, while the Democrats are saying, we're going to keep benefits the same as they have always been, but we know we got to put more money in it. And we're going to ask people who make more than $400,000 a year to kick in some more money because they've, they've paid so much less than everybody else for the last 40 years. So that's another big piece of doublespeak in that document. So helpful, so illuminating. We have to be confident as we go out there and they hide behind some of this flowery policy language and get to concretely what this would actually mean. Okay, another thing that's been coming up is that uh, we are hearing now about Agenda 47, which is on Trump's website, and the GOP platform was just announced for the Republican National Convention. How is this all linked together to Project 2025? Okay, so so this is actually really important, a really important moment to step back because Project 2025 was the Heritage Foundation and all these other uh, right-wing institutions. Uh, Agenda 47 is the official campaign, Trump campaign's uh, plan going forward. And the Republican platform is what the party itself stands on. And that, uh, that party, of course, is now the Trump party. They are all related. They all call for things like cutting... Um, the civil servants so that they they uh, they we, they put loyalists in their places. They all call for a strong president who cannot be checked by either the courts or by Congress. They all call for imposing certain things that they call like protecting the family, but by that they mean getting rid of LGBTQ plus protections. Um, 
they call for manipulating the the society so it becomes a, a, a country based in their version of Christianity, which, by the way, is pretty complicated. Christianity, I mean, people used to have wars over, you know, things like baptism. So that, you know, to say we're going to be a Christian nation itself is very complicated, even though it's completely ahistorical. But what you need to really think about all these as being a piece of is really simple. That's that people like me and people who formed this country and who represented this country at its very best believe that people really are created equal and they have a right to be treated equally before the law and they have a right to have a say in their government. People who are backing Project 2025, Agenda 47, the Republican Party platform, people like those in the extremist far right now, which has taken over the Republican Party. This is not your mother's Republican Party. Those people don't believe that. They believe that, in fact, not everybody is created equal, that some people really are better than others, and they have the right and maybe even the duty to rule the rest of us, that they're the only ones who truly understand how to order a society in a way that's best for everybody, and they should be able to tell the rest of us what to do. And the different projects you're talking about, 25, 47, and the platform, are all blueprints for taking our American democracy, which has evolved really since 1965 when we got the Voting Rights Act, to enable everybody to have a say in it, even though that's been chipped away a lot recently, that that government, they think, is not good for American society. And we should go back to a time before 1965 and really in many ways before 1933 when we started to get business regulation and all that. And we should go back to that time and turn our country over to usually wealthy, usually white men to tell the rest of us how to live our lives. And, you know, they're different worldviews. They're ones that have always been in tension in American society and in other societies as well. But the idea that we are created equal and have a right to a say in our government is just as radical and exciting as it is today as it was in 1776. And people who sit there and say, oh, democracy doesn't work. And, you know, we don't, we don't, you know, we could do a lot better. Sure, we could do a lot better. But look at a place like Ukraine, which would like more than anything to have have control over its own laws and to be able to protect its own right to govern itself without having Russia come and take it over. Or look at a place where women don't have the right to vote or have any right to be protected by the laws or places where LGBTQ people can literally be killed for who they are and recognize just how exciting it is to be part of a society where we're protected, where we stand for each other. And that's, I think, the real thing to understand about all these agendas is they're literally saying to people like me and you, Katie, and many of the people here, we don't think you're as good as the rest of us and you should do what we say. And when I think about that and I think about how many things that we have accomplished in this world by listening to people who in other societies would be, you know, silenced, I think, how dare you take us back to that or, or try to impose it on us? And what do you think that is going to do to the 21st century if instead of having to achieve uh, uh a voice in society because of your marriage or because you see things in a new way, you get to run into everything because you're rich and male and, and white, you know, we're not going in a good direction if we do that. So if you look at the bigger picture here, do you believe we're equal and we have a right to have to determine our own destiny? Or do you believe that some people are better than others and have a right to control us? All right, Heather, here's where we pivot from the doom, the gloom, of what Project 2025 is. I'm hearing some people in the chat say, I'm exhausted. This is overwhelming. Thank you for this information. But we have to remember, the point is they do want us to throw up our hands and say, I'm exhausted. It's just too much. And so that's why we love working together, Heather, because we know very clear-eyed what we're facing and we are very action-oriented as well. And the key to beating Project 2025 is flipping the numbers. Today, 70% of voters don't know about it. We need to make it so at least 70% of voters know about it. And that means being willing to talk to everyone that we know, everyone in our communities, friends, family, people at the gym, our networks, all of it. The waiter, anyone you're, you know, you're talking to at out, out and about in your day-to-day -day life. And so I'm going to bring on 
one of my favorite people, your favorite people, I Red, White, and Blue's favorite people, Jess McIntosh. She is our messaging expert here at Red, White, and Blue. And the three of us are going to talk about how do we actually have this conversation, okay? So this is the pivot point where we go to exactly what is on all of us to do because we have to let people know about this because that is how we influence this at the ballot box. So we know it's important to talk about Project 2025 with our family, our friends, and our communities, Just, but how do we do it? And who should we be focused on? Is, is everyone the same or do I focus on one person over another? It can get really overwhelming. Yes. And thank you for all. Thank you for this conversation, this incredible information. I have learned stuff and mostly I'm just insanely excited to see how uh, dynamic this chat is and how many people are here waiting to help save democracy. So who do you talk to? Um, the most important thing to remember is that over 70 percent of Americans don't know what Project 2025 is. That means you are talking to almost everybody. And as we say a lot on the red wine and blue calls, the majority of Americans agree with us on most of the things. They want public education to be good and quality and well-rounded. They want kids to be safe and in inclusive, welcoming spaces. They want women and people who can get pregnant to have access to the reproductive care that they need. They want to plan their own families, all the basic stuff. Most people agree with us. So when you combine that most people agree with us on most things and most people have never heard about Project 2025, feel free to talk about it. Almost everybody you will encounter both agrees with you and doesn't know what's going on. So, so I want to say that first. But I do want to say a really quick note about who not to talk to, because being demoralized is a big part of their playbook. They are going to do specific things to stop you from joining calls like this, from talking to your networks, from taking any kinds of action. So I want to do a little exercise here. I want everybody to picture the change my mind guy, right? We've all seen this meme. There's a man in a public park. He's sitting at a table with a folding chair. He has a sign in front of him. It says, women are bad drivers. Change my mind, right? I love an argument. Like, I actually, I love a debate. Like, I will spend an afternoon happily doing that. If I saw this man in the park, I would be able to decimate that argument in a single sentence. Want me to do it? Okay. Women are better drivers. We know this because we have lower insurance. Done. I'm done. The insurance companies are not doing some woke agenda to write the patriarchal scales. They they give us a better deal because we're better drivers. Ergo, women are better at driving. We're done. If I were to stop in the park to tell that man that sentence, would I change his mind? No, no, not a chance. What would I succeed? Would, would he be happy that I stopped? Yeah, yeah, he would. Because his goal is not to debate me. It is to waste my time. And I need you all to remember how many people are out there trying to do exactly that. You will find them on Facebook. You will also find them in your communities. So when you are dealing with the opposition, with people who, who are firmly entrenched in this stuff, and, I, and I'm, I, I feel for everybody who has family and close relatives in this situation, that is a very long process of, of kind of deprogramming to get people to see that point. We're not talking about that. We're talking about talking to your networks. So when you run in to that uncle you're never going to get, let it go. Preserve your own mental health space. That matters so much. Like your energy level is actually key to democracy. So that is my who to talk to, um, who to talk to guidance right there. Vast majority of people, all systems go, let them know what's happening. Those that you know are on that other side, just, just keep walking. You don't have to change his mind. You're not going to. Heather, you're on Facebook a lot. You're having people come and ask these sorts of questions to what, what advice are you giving to people? who are, you know, getting these quite, how do I respond to this person? How do I respond to this one? What are you seeing the practical application of this out there? Well, I would say absolutely what Jess said, because somebody always says, how am I going to change that uncle? And the answer is always, you're not. In any kind of a right-wing reactionary moment, the most that that movement will ever get, the most, the top is 32%. So those people, and that's the top, they're lost. Don't waste your time. It's everybody else. The other thing I would say about social media is to be really aware of is that, especially now with AI, there's a lot of bots and trolls that seem real, but they are not. Once again, do not waste your time because they get paid based on clicks and based, based on people interacting with them. Their job is to waste your time. And you can block those people and move on. You know, that 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 is in this moment, really important to remember. 
Okay, 1000%. Jess, thank you for this. We're probably going to have you back between now and the election many times to remind us of this, where to direct our energy, because energy is limited, you know, and so we have got to use it in the maximum best way, every single way to carry these messages from Heather's newsletter and about Project 2025. So thank you. And we will do that. I think another thing, um, Jess, I know that we've talked about is the importance of personalizing Project 2025, it can be so overwhelming, but many of us have personal stories that connect to these direct attacks on our personal you know, way of life. And being able to speak to those things, we know, right? I mean, you're the expert on this, right? Like personal stories are always the way to get through to anyone who's just kind of tuned out, right? Right. I, I mean, I love us because we want facts. We want facts, we want statistics, we want page numbers, we want citations. And I love that about us. That is not actually how you make a connection with somebody to begin talking about issues like this. The way to do it is through emotional resonance. You want to meet them where they are as parents, as community members, as people who are frightened to be living in our Lord's year 2024. You want to actually talk to them as people. And so that means sharing a little bit about who you are, why you feel the way that you do, asking a lot of questions and, and listening. Um, it, it's about making that human connection and finding common ground. And, and there's a group of people who are not the change my mind guy that I was talking about, but who may be confused. They might, there's a lot of misinformation out there. A lot of people have seen that and believe it and are operating in good faith on bad information. We need to find common ground with them, learn what their concerns are. Most of the time, you're going to share those concerns. You know, if they're worried about what their kids are getting taught in school, well, they might be coming at it from that other point of view. But you're also worried about what your kids are getting taught in school. In fact, that's why you're so concerned about Project 2025, because it's going to take away teachers' ability to decide what the best curriculum for your kids are. It, it's it's finding that common ground and 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 meeting them there. And not focusing, if you're talking about page numbers, you guys, you're talking to the wrong people. You know, like the, if you're talking about values and finding this common ground, you're talking to the right people and you're going to start moving them. If you're talking about page numbers and citations, you're probably overly focused on that one person. So I do want to get to someone who's really good at personalizing this, Heather, because I know this is something that you are always talking about. I want to bring on Tori, um, who is in North Carolina. Tori, you are a uh, military spouse. And so I just wanted to know if you could quick, we're running out of time, give us an example of how on the ground you're personalizing because the attacts on vets are so yeah. real in Project yeah. 2025. Yeah, so I'm a military spouse. I also was born and raised in a military family. My father served this nation for 27 years. And when you talk about vets and you talk about reducing their benefits, it gets really, really personal for a lot of people in all of our states. You know, these are the men and women who stand on our behalf and protect our freedom and our rights in a way that civilians never have to quite deal with. So the last thing we want to do is take from them, right? And, and when you take away their benefits, it's just going to be a almost a tumbleweed of uh, mental health decline, livelihood dec decline, the workforce would be impacted by about 30%. Um, and then you're also not only affecting the veterans, but all of their, uh, all of their children, their spouses, it's, it's just a really nasty um, start to not taking care of the people that we should be taking care of the ones who take care of us every day by sacrificing so much um, and so we don't need to take from them. Another way that Project 2025 is coming for the military is it wants to limit diversity in all sorts of ways. And uh, we've worked way too hard in this country to get racial equity and diversity and inclusion where it is today to stop and to have that ripped away or to go backwards. And that's what Project 2025 wants to do. We have to stand up today and right now and say not on our watch and we have to fight back and i think that common ground is a really good place to start and you can start with the military you can start with the veterans um i love what heather was saying about we're equal it's about seeing each other and deciding that i am no better than you i am no worse than you we are equal and we can do this together
Heather, are you hearing from folks in the military when it comes to, you know, sometimes there's this narrative, right? That like military folks are, you know, on the Trump side. What, what are you hearing out there from folks in the military veterans? Yeah, I think Tori's point is a really good one. It's important to remember that 40% of the American military are people of color. And this idea that everybody is in the military is um, somebody who would throw over our Constitution to support Trump, I think is just wrong. Remember, the military has a very strong history of its own rules and regulations that they are very strict about for really interesting historical reasons. And they, if you remember, in June of 2020, when Trump tried to get the military on his side, those military leaders like uh, 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 General Milley, um, Mark Milley, and other ones from all the branches came out and said, no, we stand for the Constitution. We stand for our soldiers who are people of color, uh, who are from across this country, and we stand for the idea that we should all be considered equal before the law. Now, remember, if Trump is reelected, one of the things in Project 2025 says we will not have a military that is loyal to its own rules and regulations in the U.S. Constitution. He will appoint people who are loyal to him alone. That's really clear. So we lose everything that Tory's talking about. We lose that entire historical underpinning of those people who are protecting our country, our constitution, and us. And we give it all to, to an authoritarian. Okay, Heather, we are running short on time and I want to get us to, Tori, thank you so much. And thank you for all you do every day in North Carolina. We need you out there. Um, Heather, we have, you have told us what Project 2025 is, where it comes from, why we are facing this today, what's really going on. You have told us that all of this with Agenda 47 and Project 2025, the RNC platform, it's all one thing, it's all linked. You have told us about how the fact checkers supposed on Facebook and what Meta is doing, it's just a straight up suppression of good information about this and why it's so important we understand the facts about what is in this so that we can communicate it to others. Um, you have told us how they are, how Trump is distancing himself and trying to downplay this and paper over all of what this is and how this is like classic what they do from the authoritarian playbook. Heather, I know that you know that tonight is really only the beginning. Yeah, and I'm going to say something else as well, Katie. You know, we know, people who study politics know that the way you change society is one person at a time. You talk to people one person at a time. There is nothing more valuable than that. And what Red, Wine, and Blue does is it gives you the tools to do that. And is that we're all scared, you know, and we are. There's a lot going on that we've never seen in the United States before, and it's a frightening time. But in these moments when you get this sort of chaos and the fear, I think one of the things that really jumps out to me, and you look at all the people on this call, is it's also a time of extraordinary joy. I mean, we get to do this. We get to create a new nation. And you think about everything that's out there now, the new languages, the new music, the new ways to think about the world, the new literature, the new art, all the stuff that is suggesting a direction that we could go, a new kind of America. It's certainly worth being frightened, but it's also kind of worth thinking about this as a bit of a celebration. You know, it's a party, and I don't mean a political party. I mean, it is a celebration that I'm incredibly excited to be part of. And the fact that Red, Wine, and Blue provides the tools and the connections so that people can see not only that they're part of something bigger, but how to bring it home and find your squad, find your people in your own town and in your own state. You know, that's really cool. And, and I'm not wrong, I think, when I say that the history books will write about this. And to be part of this moment is sort of a quiet revolution, but it's one that that it's really, I think, an honor uh, to be part of uh, this longer conversation about what it means to achieve human self-determination in, in our world. The Suburban Women Problem was created by Red, Wine, and Blue. Our producer and editor is Amy Thorstenson, our project manager is Lindsay Quist, and our editorial assistant is Abigail Martin. For more information about upcoming events and trainings, or to learn more about Red, Wine, and Blue, follow us on social media or at www.redwine.blue.